Hi, I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. Good, we're happy so to much. have Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Awesome. All right. Well, Leslie, why don't you start us off? Go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your book and why you decided to write it. Okay. Well, um, I'm sharing from my brand new science poetry collection, Serengeti, Plains of Grass. And um, this is my, oh, I'm going to forget what number, maybe ninth or eighth science poetry collection. Uh, but it's kind of a departure from my other ones, which were mostly critter collections, lots of humor, using all different forms of poetry. And Serengeti Plains of Grass is a more reverential exploration of the Serengeti Plain in East Africa, which I was lucky enough to visit quite a number of years ago. And that visit stuck with me for many, many years. And I didn't, I knew I wanted to write about it at some point, but I wasn't sure how I was going to find my way into it. And of course, I always fantasize to go back and visit it again, which um, I'm now doing just with my poet's heart and lots of research. Um, actually, I did it a, a while ago, and it's taken a while to get the book in just the form that we wanted to present it to readers. So I'm very excited. It's been a long time coming. And this book uses one form of poetry that's interconnected throughout the whole book. And it's connected with the poetry form, which is a Swahili poetry form that I adapted into English, a traditional form. And it's all, each stanza is connected to the next, both uh, conceptually in terms of the food web in the Serengeti, and also in the seasonal migration of great migration of wildebeest zebras and others into and out of the Serengeti short grass plain. So there's a lot of layers of organization going on. And then I choose critters to sort of represent different levels in the food web and tell the story of these amazing herbivores coming in and out of the Serengeti Plain. That's really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. All right, David, you're up. Tell us a bit about yourself and about your book and why you chose to write it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm fascinated, Leslie, by, by your book and by how you came, came at it. Well, in my case, um, in uh, undergraduate school, I majored in biology and minored in geology and um, graduate school in, at um, Emory in, uh, University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it was still in science. Actually, I studied tapeworms, if you can believe it, parasitology. But coming out of a science background feeds my, uh, has fed my lifelong interest in uh, writing about nature and the things you find there. Mostly uh, it's about living creatures, but I do like to write about mountains and rocks and caves and such. Uh, in this uh, present instance, um, I got to thinking one day about the, the things that live under our feet. And it sort of caught my uh, interest because you know most of the things that live below us don't live there all the time. They, they may dig a burrow and have their babies or something, but uh, it's still a busy place. And when kids especially uh, run across a yard, I thought, well, I kind of like for them to know something more about what's going on beneath them. Now, in the case of water, the, a lake or a river or the ocean, we can get into that. You know, we can put on goggles or whatever, hold our nose and dive down and we can see at least the surface uh, kinds of creatures that are there. But in the case of dirt, what are you gonna do? Um, so that was, this is my, my effort to um, make kids a little bit more uh, conscious, a little bit more aware. So uh, when we have time here in a few minutes, I'll read a a poem or two and uh, or whatever time we have and I'm eager to hear Leslie read from hers. Oh same here and actually I want to just uh, jump in and say that I think uh, even though we David and I have not met we've sort of been in traveling around each other in circles online and through poetry and I also have a science background. Um, I have a graduate degree in oceanography but I um, 
I have uh, Leaf Litter Critters is one of my earlier books. And that is, you know, really starts with bacteria and goes through the whole brown food web cycle. And the same thing, just this fascination with what's going on it in is, this world yeah. that we can't see under our feet. So much and fun. I, I and I think that people like us um, bring something to the table that uh, adds value for the kids. I mean, we know a little bit about what we're talking about. We've sort of been there and, um, and we love our subject. And um, it's just kind of hard, at least it is for me, to pick up a subject that I don't, I don't identify with. Um, may or may not like it, but I'm, I'm sure not all that knowledgeable. And mm -hmm. I can read up on it and, and uh, trick you for a little bit to think I know more than I do. But you know, these are the kinds of books that probably have more value uh, to the young reader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd have to agree with that too, with having value to the young reader, because I think what's nice about you exploring what's underneath our feet is kids love getting into the dirt, playing in the dirt, so to help them have that better understanding of what they're actually getting into is, is such a good concept too for them. So, well, since you did bring up sharing some poems, David, why don't you go ahead and start us off with a poem or two from your book? Okay. <laughs> um, this is a top fold book. Kate Cosgrove is just a wonderful artist. And when um, I borrowed an idea from Einstein, I thought if we're going to dig down into the dirt, you need a way to get there. So how about a magic elevator? And um, you know, Einstein imagined an elevator in space um, with a full lab in it so he could he could draw, he could consider his um, experiments in space and ha it helped him learn more about what he was studying. So in this case, um, because of the elevator, Kate decided, and I love it, that it should be top fold. It gives a better sense of going down into the ground and you know gave her more room to dig this, this out. Elevator, that's a tree, I guess, and it's just uh, a clever idea on her part. The, the whole book is full of her clever ideas. So I'll read one to uh, start us, and that's <coughs> recipe. It was a dirt recipe. <laughs> and it goes, I'm sorry to be so awkward with this, but a top hole, top hole <laughs> is a great idea until you try to hold it and open it. <laughs> you need, need a, a table and two helpers. Well, uh, grind up flakes cracked from rocks and chipped by prying roots. Add dead things like rotting leaves, bees, decaying shoots. Mix with maggots, beetles, mites, centipedes, worms. Um, sirs, a host of hungry uh, fungi and at least a billion germs. <laughs> so th that's the opening poem. Now this book has, um, Leslie, I, I don't know whether you go the same route, but there's back matter um, oh, yes. to tell you more about um, each subject. So here's, um, little 100 word little essay on each of the subjects. So I'm, I'm not going to read, uh, relax, uh, all of <laughs> 100 words on dirt, but it does tell you more about it than I could in the poem. You know, did you know that rain and root uh, roots help make dirt, water seeping through the soil softens the earth around buried, buried rocks and, and so on? Uh, some of which we know, but a lot of which we may not. And so you read the poem and then you can also Go to the back for more information. How do you want to do this, Leslie? You want to? Shall I read another one, or do you want to read? You want to take turns reading, or what would what would you like? Well, I think when I do mine, because my poems are interconnected, I'm going to read them all well, in a row. Right. So why don't, why don't you go ahead then? Okay, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, then here's uh, I have two more that I would like to read, but I can read them at any time. So uh, this is about ants and. 
I've always been fascinated by these things. They they build these incredible tunnels, some of them very, very deep, you know, 10, 12 feet down into the earth. It's dark down there. They're, they don't have a leader. It's not like somebody say, move the furniture over here. You know, the, the nest goes over there. They somehow make a nest. City builder, a thousand ants without a sound build a city underground. Without light, they build halls. Down and down the city sprawls. Without rest, they tug and toil. Grain by grain, remove soil. Without a leader in the gloom, they scoop and hollow out each room. Without tools, they clean and sweep and build their city strong and deep. Um, can I do this other one now and get it out of the way? Or yeah. what do you think? Okay. But not get it out of the way. We're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind. Yeah, I know. It's not a it's not a rush here. We're liking these poems. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, after doing this whole book about dirt, I, my editor said, you know, you need us kind of to sum it up. So I did. And this is what came out. And it's... Uh, it turns out that it's a very ancient form of uh, poetry. I, I was unaware of it. I just, I thought I discovered my own, but it goes back to you know, hundreds of years. So it's about time we dug it out again. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> so here we go. Uh, and, and now we know. Beneath our feet, beyond our sight, below the roots where green grass grows, there's more to dirt than we'd suppose. In places black as black as night, creatures slither, wriggle, creep, nurse their babies, snuggle, sleep. There's more to dirt than we'd suppose. Quiet things in hidden holes burrow down where secrets lie. There's more to dirt than meets the eye. From centipedes to mousy voles, they come and go without a sound, seek their safety underground. There's more to dirt that meets the eye. Creatures large and small retreat where boulders rest and tree roots sink a drink. There's more to dirt than we might think. So many lies beneath our feet, so much to learn, so much to know. And now we've learned a lot, although we, there's more to dirt than we might think. Oh, I love that. I know, I love that too. And you said that's the last poem, right? To wrap everything up. Oh, mm -hmm. what a great one. Yeah. That is that's wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. What, what is the ancient form that you reinvented? I don't <laughs> even remember the name of it. If it's from some country, I don't remember either. That's the advantage of being my age. I don't have to apologize anymore. <laughs> I can just forget. I don't think anybody needs to apologize anytime, really. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I'm fascinated by that form. I love it. I really do. I love the repetition of it and the don't sort you of yeah. cyclical. Yeah, really, really it, nice. It fascinates me now that I know that it's for real and it's and it's an old old timer. I kind yeah. of relate to it, and I, I I'd sort of <laughs> like to do some others, but so far I haven't had a subject um, that has lent itself to another one. I've tried a couple that they they were terrible, so I threw them away. <laughs> It is interesting how that happens that, mm -hmm. you know, you might try a particular form for a particular subject and it just yeah. doesn't quite work. Mm -hmm. And then you have to say, well, I, I need to go in another direction or something. You do. I was uh, last night reading, a, I finished reading a new book by Billy Collins, who is uh, one of my favorite uh, yeah. poets. And um, in his uh, uh, afterward, he was thanking people and he thanked his wife and so on. But uh, I was um, uh, interested in how he said that uh, he has one reader who just gives him a grade card. That's all he does is just give him a, on a scale of one to 10. And they said uh, anything uh, below a two, one being the best, I throw away. So even oh. he um, struggles just like the rest of us with some are better than others and some mm -hmm. don't work at all. Absolutely right. Yeah, I have many, many versions 
of all of my poems, really. <laughs> Did they ever come out the way you want them the first time? Probably not. <laughs> oh, no. and, I don't know about you, but a lot, a lot of my stuff never comes out the way I thought it was going to, but you just come as close as you can and you finally abandon it and go on to something else. Very true. Very All right, true. well, speaking of poems being abandoned, how about we go to poems not abandoned? Leslie, would you like to share <laughs> some of yours that weren't abandoned? <laughs> sure, I will. So, um, as I mentioned, um, Serengeti, Plains of Grass, is all one form. It's, the, it's called the Utendi, it's a Swahili stanza. And it's a traditional form that's dealt with serious subjects and also um, kind of uh, ways to live a good life in the world. And so I like to think of that whole idea with this book. So the, it's a four line stanza. The first three lines and in in Swahili, in the language key Swahili, it ends in a rhyme because all key Swahili words end with a vowel. So it each word ends with the same vowel. So in my ear, that sounded more like a partial rhyme than a perfect rhyme. So I chose to end my words with the same consonant sound. So it's a partial rhyme with the same consonant sound. So the first three lines have that partial rhyme. And the last line is a refrain. And the refrain is the word grass, which is the basis of this savanna grassland ecosystem. So each one relates to the grass. So I, I thought I'd share the first few, maybe four. They're just four lines long, but um, to, so you can see how they connect. And I'm going to show you these gorgeous panoramic illustrations from Becca Statlander. Um, I'll pull back so you can see this first Those one. Those are so them. beautiful. They're, they are spectacular. Pastel and gouache. Um, to me, illustration is magic. I don't know how people do that and make these gorgeous things come out, but I'm so honored to have this in my book. So this is the first stanza. And I, oh, I just want to also say, um, when David was talking about back matter and how we do things, I have lots of back matter in my books, but I also have little um, narrative science notes. Um, and with this book, I kept them, I'm not going to read them also, I'm gonna just read the poem, but I kept them very spare. Um, sometimes I can really blah, blah, blah in the science notes because I'm fascinated and I want to share everything. But in this case, I didn't. And I'm just going to share the poem stanzas for these few. Parched soil bed of volcano ash, roots asleep in a tangled mesh. One drop, two, then downpours rush. First rains wake new blades of grass. Hoofbeats thunder under blazing sun. A great migration toward the plain. Grazing zebras, first to begin, clear away taller, tougher grass. Wildebeests feast on shorter swards. Oxpecker birds are stowaboards. News trample roots in shaggy herds, spreading manure for growing grass. Plains are cropped where wildebeests grazed, leaving tender herbs exposed. Low ground growth is nimbly used. Fleet gazelles nibble new mown grass. And I'll stop there to show that even in this reverential book, I'm not above a little word play because that's G-N-U mown grass, so. Uh, on it goes to the end when the all of the animals that are in the migration leave the Serengeti shortgrass plain following the rains to the next part of their um, migration circuit. I love those. Thank wonderful. You, David. Yeah, I love how they all connect is just, I love that it's just continued on with the story. I really enjoyed that going through um, 
using that refrain of grass and relating it to each specific animal as I went through. So there's a snake in the grass and giraffes still walking through the grass. And it was a, a lot of fun to play with that. You know, when you're writing poetry, you're, you're playing with words, you're playing with ideas. Um, and that's, that's what's, um, you know, fun for the poet as well to figure out how you're going to present that. Well, that actually uh, kind of leads into our first question is uh, what is your, uh, and either of you can start with this first, but what is your process for writing poems? And uh, do you believe that writing poems and verse is actually more difficult than non-poetry writing? I'll, I'll let you take that away first, David, if you want. Um, my method, if there is such a thing, is um, when I do, stumble across an idea, which I stumble better all the time. Um, <laughs> but with practice, uh, over so many years, those of us who write become pretty adept at finding ideas. Well, we used to think they were hard to come by, and now we have so many we can never attend to all of them. So um, therefore, I don't mind throwing one away if I get into it a little bit, and, and I just don't feel like it's going to be there. Uh, I'll go on to something else. So when I do find one, like uh, like Leslie implied a minute ago, you don't know how many drafts of this thing <laughs> you're signing up to do. And um, very often it's uh, half a dozen or more and sometimes a lot more than that. So, um, and I've also tried writing poems that rhyme and then rephrasing it as free verse. I've done the same thing with uh, stories, you know, picture book stories. Uh, so it's, it's partly a matter of uh, intuition and partly ex you know, ex experience. Joyce Hall, who founded Hallmark Cards, used to tell people that he knew what he knew because of the vapors of his experience, which I just love. And so we, we do you know, move that pen around and the keyboard picking around on that until something finally clicks. Sometimes it's a rhythm, sometimes it's a, it's a catchy phrase, um, just a single word can do it. Um, so it's an experience, it's an adventure and um, hopefully you'll get there. <laughs> Be prepared to bail out if you don't. <laughs> As far as, um, well, let me just answer that one question and then uh, Leslie can play with it. Okay, well, you know, I, I agree with that about experience. And I think um, for me, so much of it is, at, the more experience you have, the more um, you're writing poetry, you've read poetry, um, you, you hear the music in a certain way. And so, you know, sometimes people ask, you know, how do you know when you've gotten to something that works or doesn't work? And that's the piece that I think really comes with that experience of hearing that music. And so you don't have to test yourself. Um, you know, have I done this correctly? Have I followed every rule of this poem? I always, uh, you know, when people ask about when you're starting, you know, experimenting with a new poetic form, um, you read lots and lots of poems that other people have written in that form, and you internalize that music. And then you're making that music yourself, and you know whether you're hearing the music or you're not hearing the music. It's not to say that you can't have people read and comment on your poems, because I have a critique group, and, you know, sometimes you know, they'll sort of look at me. It's not so much about the music as like, this is a really complicated science poem and I don't get what's going on here. And that's extremely helpful to me, extremely helpful. But as far as the music of the poem, that's coming from inside me now, from all of the poems that I've written and heard and, and the songs I've heard and all of that sort of goes into that feeding of the music of poetry. And, and I think that that's, that is the piece that speaks to experience for me. Uh, I love 
that you're talking about the music because I think we we do hear it. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes we see it too. It's almost like watching a little video in our heads and we're trying to, to describe it. Uh, but I was a professional musician in my, oh. in my younger days and taught music. So I've always had that same sense that you do of hearing, hearing the, the, the music. And um, I was in a band one time when the, the uh, it was a college band at the, on that occasion, I was a soloist and I was into syncopation for some reason that day and it was screwing up the rest of the band because <laughs> they think I was too far behind and I'd be ahead. And so he finally got me aside and said, hey, just play it straight, will you? Because you're, you're <laughs> confusing everybody. And I'm, I'm afraid sometimes I still do that <laughs> yeah, because I like to play with form and um, it yeah. all has its own sound and its own rhythm. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, but I think that, that again speaks to the experience. You know, when you're, when you're learning a new form, there, there are certain, you know, it's supposed to have this many syllables or, this many strong beats, or you know, this is supposed to rhyme exactly with this. But yeah. you know, when you are working on a poem, that you can play with those rules a little bit, right? If you're hearing that music, if you're just playing with the rules to make a word that you want to use work, that's not okay because it's right. not going to make the music. But if you're playing with the rules because you're hearing the music, then it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, next question. Has a poem of yours ever humbled or even frightened you? And if neither of those emotions, what emotion has sparked inside of you from one of your poems, like intense emotion? Well, you know, um, when, when we knew that you were going to ask this question, do you mind if I jump in here, David? Because I, no, I found please, something please, really I was, funny. I, was... I found something really funny from um, my past, uh, one of my past books. But I always remembered this uh, when we were talking about some forms that work and some forms that don't work. So um, I was writing a poem for at the Seafloor Cafe, which is was my second science poetry book. And... Um, I had decided to write about a decorator crab. So a decorator crab takes a sea anemone and it's a, a hermit crab, takes a sea anemone and sticks it to the back of the shell that it's crawled into. And then it's protection for it. And the sea anemone gets some of the little bits of detritus that the hermit crab tears apart and floats around in the water. So. You know, it's a really mutualistic kind of a relationship, but it's, it's uh, you know, the anemones sting, so they keep some predators away from the hermit crab. And I decided to write a tanka. So it's a Japanese form, um, five lines instead of the three lines of a haiku. And I started writing one tanka after another, and they were coming out so serious that I actually did write something that was sort of like maybe something a little grim and frightening from my family history or something. So I'll, I found it. I, I'll read it to you. Um, a dusky crab decorator hides beneath dangerous gems, moving on. Each new home wears the old warning signs. I was like, ooh, <laughs> that is not funny. <laughs> I was going for funny. And uh, that's kind of a little sad. So I tossed out Tonka and I took, I wrote a sinking, which is uh, something that an American poet sort of adapted from Japanese forms. And it, you know, it came out funny. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was I had to just toss the other thing because it was just there was no way I could have it come out and not be sort of this grim serious thing. So that was a good example of that really. <laughs> it's <so> <laughs> odd. <coughs> How about you David? Um, <coughs> sorry <coughs> this morning there was a, a wasp flying around in our bedroom so I, I killed it. Um, but it, as I was contemplating this this uh, question, it, that reminded me of a, 
of a poem I wrote in a book many years ago called Death of the Wasp. And uh, it's bumping, I found this dead wasp on a windowsill. Bumping at the window pane, he fought against the solid air that held him as a prisoner there, but all his struggles were in vain. By the way, it would have been a she, not a he. Sorry about that, and I'm an old entomologist. Never comprehending glass, clear as air that stopped him hard and blocked his freedom to the yard. Repeatedly, he tried to pass. Eventually, he lost his fight and perished on a sunny sill, facing toward his freedom still. Wings awry in broken flight. He had a name, Trapoxylum, a small but vibrant living thing who came in by the door in spring and in a day or two was gone. Now, my editor for this book, Alligator in the Closet, cried, she said, when she read that poem. And she asked, being a good editor, if I could write a whole book of poems like that. So that one poem led to um, uh, connecting the dots, uh, an, an autobiographical uh, collection of some 64 poems that came after that that dead wasp. And yet this morning I cold-heartedly killed that wasp in my bedroom. So sometimes we do make up the circumstances a little bit. Yeah, but it's a very interesting poem because you know, we all can't stand wasps. We want to kill the wasp and stuff. And yet when you're reading it, I was like, I want to protect the wasp. I want to yeah. make sure it's safe. It did ev invoke that sad emotion to a creature I've never wanted to save, <laughs> you know? And Well, yeah. I think that's, that's what storytellers do, of course. And poetry is a short form of, of getting it out there uh, in, a, in a hurry. And so, yeah, I, I still like that poem. And it's true, it was based on a dead wasp. I, I didn't have to kill that one. <laughs> <laughs> David, is that book connecting the dots for young readers also? Oh, it, it's, uh, it's, it starts with my early memories of being bitten on a thumb by a dog, our pet dog who was napping on the back steps and I pushed it off in my hurry to go to the bathroom and it bit me and I learned a couple of lessons, start <laughs> sooner and be nicer to dogs. And, and it went all the way up. I was 65 when I finished the book. So uh, received wisdom told me that I wouldn't have an audience for that because uh, in some areas of the book, I was 60 years old, you know, it, what, what made a believer of me was that uh, poetry in the classroom or for young people was that book. Because when reviews from students came in, they liked knowing the future. They liked knowing what was going to, what had happened to me as I grew up and therefore by extension could happen to them. And um, uh, I, I signed off the last poem by uh, uh, loving my wife, lying in bed at night, listening to her breathing and so on. And um, so I, I just learned that poetry has a very wide range if it's, if it's handled with respect for the reader. Yeah. That's lovely. Yeah, you never know who, how, how a poem is going to affect someone and who it's going to affect. And Leslie, even going back to your your original one you wrote that you're like this was supposed to be funny and not frightening but I still enjoyed it immensely because I like that little bit of fear because it is a natural thing that we go through and trying to build a protection for ourselves but still maybe you making it look kind of good and <laughs> decorating it a little bit. <laughs> well I think kids kids want us to be the grown-up you know I mean, we can we can be silly if we're silly the way grown-ups are silly. Yeah. But if we try to be silly like they are, they, they spot a phony ever you know, a mile away. <laughs> that is very true. Um, kind of jumping around here as we're talking about uh, young readers, uh, what advice would you give to young poets? A little kid, teenagers, however young, what advice would you give? Um, shall I take a swing at that one? Sure. Okay. I think what we're, what we're shooting for isn't to write poetry. I think what we're 
wanting is to get kids hooked on writing, on, on expressing themselves, on seeing visions, on learning to manipulate words, uh, sounds, meaning. And so if poetry is the goal, it's more of a long-term goal. And I don't think they should, the, the, the teachers, the parents, uh, or the child should expect to produce um, poetry that's particularly good. But then that's okay, that's not the goal. And if, it, it, as long as we're honest with them and say, okay, this is, a, it's like learning how to run 26 miles, do a marathon. You don't, you don't just say tomorrow, I think I'll run a marathon. You start, you know, exercising and getting better and better. And it may take years. In my case, I never got there because I didn't much care. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I think it's that kind of a development. And uh, I, I rejoice when I see a child um, trying to write something that shows you that he or she is actually thinking about something, is thinking about the subject. Um, and the older ones, of course, are appropriately better, but they're still beginners. Um, they just, we all have to learn. Leslie? Well, I think, I think we're, all, we're all learning as we go. You know, <laughs> I think that, that whether you're writing poetry or writing prose, um, it's not so different in how you get started, which is to just to be reading and to read everything that you can get your hands on and start to understand what speaks to you. I think, um, you know, with stories, what kind of stories do you like? With poetry, what kind of poetry speaks to you? Everybody doesn't like every poem and that's perfectly okay. I don't like every poem. I don't expect anybody to like every no. poem. And so if you, if you like rhyme, and rhythm, read lots of rhyme and rhythm poems, and then you can start to hear that music that we were talking about. And if you like poems that don't rhyme, read lots and lots of those and start to hear that kind of music because those have their own kind of music too. And you're not deconstructing them to figure out what works. You're listening to your own poetic ear and what and what is hitting it in a way that you love or respond to in some way. So the, in the same vein, just, you know, read, read, read. When I was a kid, I read A.A. Um, a. Milne's When We Were Very Young and Now We Are Six. And I loved those poems. And so I still do a lot of rhyme and rhythm, um, but there's also the other elements of it. The um, telling a bit of a story, having a little bit of humor in it, having heart in it. All of those things were in that poetry for me. And, and there's lots of other ways to hear poetry too, in song, um, music, Broadway musicals, fantastic poetry, uh, folk songs, fantastic poetry, and you know, rap music has all kinds of rhythm and rhyme in it. Kids are listening to all different kinds of music and all of those things start to tune your ear for poetry. And if they want to write poetry, I, I think having that experience of playing with words, however you want to play with them, telling a story, writing a poem, playing with rhyme, playing with rhythm, those are all, we're all practicing. And that's, that's, how, that's how you learn to do anything. As David said, you know, when you start to run a marathon, you start, you know, by running a quarter of a mile. So you start practicing playing with words. And I, I love that. I love just enjoying language and the richness of language. And so all of the kind of reading you do will inform your prose and poetry writing. Well said. <laughs> Agreed. Both of you actually very well said. Oh, well, just jumping off of you, David. <laughs> <laughs> you two bounce off each other very well, I have to say. I love, I've, I've been loving listening to how you both are just feeding off of each other. 
Well, this is actually a really big treat for me because, as I said, you know, we've sort of known about each other for a long mm-hmm. time. And of course, uh, you know, I've probably known about David longer than he's known about my poetry, but <laughs> it's, it's just it's such a treat to meet you here online. So. Well, same here. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, not only to meet, but to exchange uh, ideas. And Me too. Learning um, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David, you mentioned earlier about um, a form of poetry that turned out to be an ancient form of poetry. Um, And to kind of play around with that, uh, how do you think poetry has grown since, let's say, like Shakespearean time? How has it progressed? How has it changed? Or how have we taken things and added our own, you know, music to it and created our own poems? How has it grown? I wish I were were a better student of all that. But, you know, we all know the rudiments of, of that, <clears throat> that in the days of Shakespeare, you know, you had open air theater a lot of times and, and uh, all male actors and so forth. Um, and that was for entertainment, but I'm sure there, was, there were lessons involved. But in that same era, most of the population was illiterate. Um, so you had the town criers, the street vendors, the, the people, the few people who could memorize at least. So you got a lot of what you knew from poets, from you know, people who would go from town to town and tell the news or what, whatever. <clears throat> so at that point, it was important to, uh, to speak in, if not in rhyme, at least in meter. Uh, it's simply easier to remember your own lessons, what you're gonna tell in the next town uh, but it's also easier for the listener to retain. And, you know, that's a simple thing to, to show. Um, read a paragraph in a, in a book and then immediately try to remember what you, what you just read. If it's in prose, odds are you can't get more than half a dozen words, if that many. If it's in rhyme, you have a much better uh, chance of retaining that for a while. Um, so over the years, a lot of the poetry was in some kind of rhyme, some kind of structured language. Then came the revolution of free free verse, and a lot of people said, I don't want to do that. I want to be free to say what I want the way I want to, and more power to them. Um, and that's still a very, very strong, popular uh, way to express yourself in poetry. But Meter and rhyme just won't go away. And um, whether it's for adults or children. Um, and so I, I'm glad for that because we do have choices. I did three or four books in rhyme before I got up the nerve to try one in free verse. To me, free verse is harder because it doesn't have any rules. It's playing tennis without a net. You have, you have, to, you have to be very confident uh, and, and your skills and, and uh, your ability to convey um, something that doesn't seem to have structure, and yet it does. Uh, after all, the English language is uh, actually an iambic uh, language. It's all, almost all iambic meter or anapestic meter, the rising meters, as opposed to some languages in other countries, which are quite different, uh, Japanese. So. It's hard not to write in some kind of meter because we we lapse into our own language. And so even free verse, it's try so hard not to be structured. Kind of is in some ways. And, and um, so I I write quite a bit of free verse, but my, my true love is something that rhymes. And, um, and the longer you do that, the better you get, I think. Uh, would you agree, Leslie? It, it just comes with having done it a lot. I, I think that's right. And, and I think that um, the longer you do it, the more you know um, what you're doing is, is something fresh and different as opposed to something that's, uh, you know, a rhyme that's been used so many times before. And, you know, those are the kind of things that come with that sort of experience. Um, I, I like all the different forms of poetry. I love learning a new form. I like having that structure of learning something that has some rules, you know, as we've talked about before. And once you really, really, really know the rules, then you can break them. 
but <laughs> before you, right. you know the rules, you have to follow them so that you understand what it's supposed to sound like um, in your ear. And um, the same with free verse, it can just, free verse can just sound like you're just breaking up sentences mm -hmm. unless you are really hearing the music in those particular words and that that is that is tricky um i don't think poetry is inherently more difficult than prose i think they both have their um moments <laughs> we'll say and um you know you you want to be doing your best work in in whatever uh, form you're writing in, and doing doing beautiful free verse is is challenging. Doing really um, musical working rhyme is also challenging. You know, when something is fresh, it's delightful in a rhyme, um, in a way that if it's not, it's like other things that have been written so you know we're we're all trying to hear our own music as we go along and make something that somebody else wants to read and say and play around with too so it's it's fun i'm i'm certainly much less of a history of poetry student than you david so i'm glad that you went first on that question but um i, I made it all up last week oh good oh good well that makes me feel so much better but well, um, I, I believed mean, I, every I, word I so <laughs> <laughs> i love shakespeare too i have to say i always loved shakespeare uh, you know since i had to study it in high school which there wasn't much in english that it was ever a had to for me because i just kind of loved that but um and actually my book random body parts has a reference to shakespeare in every poem <laughs> so um, it started with that. writing a poem in the form of the witch's speech in Macbeth um, about the stomach, which was grumble, grumble, royal and rumble instead of double, <laughs> double, toil and trouble. And then I thought, oh, I, this is a great idea. I'll just put, uh, you know, use a Shakespeare speech or a poem for everything that I do. And boy, did that get difficult really <laughs> quickly, <laughs> you know, trying to, you know, relate something to the pancreas or whatever. But sometimes it was just a phrase or... I, I really got pretty loosey goosey with it, end, but it was, that was a lot of fun too. But uh, you know, Shakespeare definitely has taught us a lot about language, and he invented all of these fabulous words that we use and phrases that we use all the time. So it was fun to get to stick those in poems too. Uh, I don't want to interrupt. Are you? I'm done. You finished that thought. Yeah. I was just going to to uh, add on to the learning how to write, and and it's. It's easier to use examples from writing in verse um, because, and you alluded to this earlier, um, a beginning poet is very tempted to force something to rhyme. Mm -hmm. Either you have to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable in the word, or you have to stretch <laughs> meter work. And so that's. You know, that's for those of us who have been there and done that so many times, we kn we know about that problem and we avoid it and we write a different rhyme, a, a different sentence, a different line. Mm -hmm. And those are the hard lessons because sometimes you have to kill your baby and you've been working you've got eight lines of perfect verse and all of a sudden you hit that wall and you say, oh man, and you just basically have to start over. Right. Or you say, well, what if I just turn the sentence in around and say it in a way that nobody ever would? <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, some of them are like, uh, throw mom off the train a kiss. You know, they, it just doesn't work quite right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. And lastly, uh, since both of your poetry books revolve around nature and this month does house Earth Day, what about nature inspires you? Your turn, Leslie. Oh, well, it, it's almost like, well, what about nature doesn't inspire you? You know, we, we live in a pretty um, remarkable planet Earth. And if you're outside exploring and listening and looking and feeling, there's just everything there is uh, remarkable. And of course, we have this great responsibility to take care of it. As, as humans in our ecosystem earth um, and 
you know, I, I was going to say the jury's out, but we already know that we're not doing a great job. Um, and we, we must do a better job. But when I go to um, a remarkable wild place like the Serengeti and almost in the same way that David was talking about, well, what is going on under your feet that you can't see? And I was looking out over this plain of grass and knowing that there were a few animals I could see, but what was uh -huh. going on under that grass and among those grasses that I couldn't see was something that I just wanted to explore forever. And that it was almost the same feeling that I get when I look out over the wide open ocean and you know all of these processes and things are going on under the surface. And um, I am lucky enough to get down and scuba dive from time to time. So I have some glimmer, just a tiny little glimmer of what's going on, but the Serengeti felt the same way. It, and you can feel that way in a city park. Yeah. You walk into a park and if you're listening to the sounds and you're sensing what's going on around you, you can just be fascinated with all of these other things that are outside of your immediate experience and want to learn and explore more about them. And that's what I want to share with young readers is to just want to be outside exploring and learning about everything that's going on around us that we don't know. And I think when we do that, we understand a little more of our responsibility to think of ourselves as one component of this ecosystem, not um, that everything else is in our way and we're trying to get to where we want to get and do what we want to do with the things we want to do them with, to you know, have that reverence for the whole planet because it's the only one we have. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was a, a nature boy when I was, I was an only child. Uh, from the time I could remember, I was outside and um, I uh, began collecting things, empty turtle shells, so skins that snakes had shed, uh, anything that had to do with nature, you know, cicada shells. What, and I would bring them home and, and uh, over time I had butterfly collections and and you name it, whatever I could pick up and bring home. So I, my love for nature, like yours, just goes back um, from to childhood. Uh, <clears throat> I too worry that that if we don't share a love for nature with our young people, uh, who else is going to tell them? Uh, how else are they going to? realize that they may not like a bat, but a bat serves a purpose or a cockroach. I was re writing this morning about why we shouldn't just write off the cockroach and leave a lot of other animals hungry, you know, so forth. Uh, so there are reasons for, for the nature to be put together the way it is. And it was all put together a long time before we came along. Mm. And now we're doing our very dead level best to screw it all up. So we're gonna have to grow up and take on our responsibilities and people like Leslie and, and I'm trying to and many, many others um, are doing our best to try to help. Uh, and then one, one more thought for me and I, I'm, I'm trying, I've been trying for quite a while um, to show how similar uh, and how many ways uh, we're similar, those who write poems for poetry for adults and those who write poetry for kids. Uh, and Wyatt Townley, who's a former poet laureate of the state of Kansas, and I uh, uh, have worked off and on for quite a while. And uh, I will send her a, one of my poems. <clears throat> she will write a poem on that same subject as she would write it as an adult po poem for an adult. <clears throat> she will send me one of hers and I'll do likewise. And. Um, it's another way of trying to get poets on the same page and, and to not be afraid of one another's work and to trust one another. And, uh, you know, it's nice to have friends in, in poetry wherever you find them. Ah, what, what a wonderful partnership. Oh, I will having, say that- Having a good um, time, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I was going to add that, um, 
you know, on, on a note of hope that uh, even though I have not uh, been to a school in person since the pandemic started, I did have, I did have an in-person program outside last summer, um, but even online and in my previous visits with students, I'm, I'm very encouraged by kids and the things that they are interested in and, and what they already know about. I do think that educators are doing a remarkable job of sharing the new, newest information about ecology and climate change and all of these things that we're so concerned about. And the students ask the most amazing questions and their questions clearly come from knowledge that certainly challenges me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm there sharing as, uh, you know, somebody who has a background in science. I'm, I've worked on my particular topics, but I'm not the scientist who is doing the research on this particular critter. And they ask me things that show that they already have more knowledge than I have about the subject. And so I have to say, you know, if you want to ask me a question about writing or <laughs> poetry or, uh, and you can ask me the critter questions, but I'm probably going to tell you that you can find out better information about that from the people who are actually doing the work, because that isn't me. And, and they're really quite knowledgeable. And I have a lot of hope from working with kids that they are going to carry on and, and, you know, come up with some better solutions than we have reached at this point in time. I'm very hopeful. I agree with that. And editors are being super careful about what they pu publish as facts. So you and I do our homework. We study our subject. We bring some that we already know to the subject and then we get more information. But uh, I don't know. They, they may trust you more than they do me, but in my case, like this dirt book, uh, after I did my best to be right about everything, it still was sent out for reading and vetting, uh, vetting with other uh, people in the in the trade. And so we got new, late, latest information for some of this stuff that I didn't know about, so. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is, I think. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Leslie and David, thank you so much for being my guests today. I know that you're both welcome at Second Star to the Right Books whenever you're in Denver. Oh, and I love so Yes, yeah, nice. please come by. Please That'd do. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun and fun to the three of us be together and to meet David and yeah. talk about all of your interesting questions. Of course. Well, thank you again. And you both have a splendid day. <laughs> Thank okay. you, you too. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.